Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 7 of the course Philosophy of Science for Psychologists. We we'll continue our discussion of relativism and constructivism by looking at the epistemology of Paul Feyerabend. And after that, we'll evaluate relativism and constructivism and we'll see that there are some severe problems with these positions. After that, we'll take a look at Feyerabend's close friend, Imre Lakatos, who is an adherent of falsificationism. So he is very much in line with what Popper said and he continued that project. Then we'll take a look at uh, Kuhn versus Lakatos because Kuhn makes the claim that Lakatos is basically saying the same as Kuhn did, but Lakatos claimed uh, that he didn't. So we'll see where that leaves us and what we have to do in next lecture. Last time we looked at the influential constructivist and relativist Thomas Kuhn. Today we look at the even more consequent, you might argue, constructivist and relativist, and that's Paul Feyerabend. Just like Kuhn, Feyerabend is a constructivist and a relativist, but where Kuhn was talking about paradigms, Feyerabend was talking about traditions and they are roughly similar in the sense that they follow each other and that they are uh, holes in which you uh, live or work um, and they follow each other and as expected from a relativist and a constructivist uh, no tradition is the better tradition right so there's no best paradigm and there's also no best tradition. Where Kuhn was basically talking about the development in science, Feyerabend is talking about development in epistemology, in gaining knowledge, in methods of acquiring knowledge. So a tradition uh, goes beyond science and current Western science is just one of many traditions in which you can acquire knowledge. So that's a difference uh, with respect to Kuhnian paradigms. Also, in Kuhn, once you in Kuhn's theory, uh, when, once you change from a paradigm to a new paradigm, there is no way of going back. So it's a Gestalt switch, but we saw that in the Gestalt switch you can go back and forth, and in Kuhn's ideas, you cannot go back and forth between paradigms. In Feyerabend's uh, ideas, you can just choose a different tradition when you want so therefore he doesn't use the term paradigm but tradition so you could choose your own paradigm to phrase it in Kuhnian uh, terms and you could choose a different paradigm tomorrow and you go back to the one uh, you started with a day after that and in Kuhn you just switch from one paradigm to another and then you stick to that paradigm unless it gets into a crisis then you go to the next paradigm Feyerabend's epistemology can be summarized in two slogans, against methods and anything goes. And just, let's just look at the first slogan, against methods. So one of his famous book is actually, books is actually called Against Method, and it's about the scientific method. And I was already talking about Feyerabend's epistemology and not about his philosophy of science, right? So, uh, but he is writing about the scientific method in that book. Is he against using the scientific method? And the answer there is, well, it seems to be, but it isn't. So that's only the suggestion from the title and the topic of the book. Um, he is not against science. He's not against using the method of science. 
he's basically pro-science, he's very interested in that, and it indeed is a method to acquire knowledge, according to Feyerabend. So what is it then that he is against? Well, let's look at the argument for relativism and constructivism first. Let's, let's look back to that. We have seen that that is the argument that is based on the theory relatedness of observation. Observation is always theory related. You need a theory to basically classify your input, to categorize your input. You need a theory. And that means, according to the constructivists, that we can never know the objective facts. We saw that in an earlier lecture. It will come as no surprise that Feyerabend makes this claim. He says, on closer analysis, we even find that science knows no bare facts at all, but that the facts, with uh, quotation marks, that enter our knowledge are already viewed in a certain way and are therefore essentially ideational. So they are based on our ideas, on our concepts, on the theory we use to observe the world. So there are no objective facts. That is, we cannot know them if there are objective facts. So that's the argument from the theory relatedness of observation. We saw that earlier and Feyerabend also gives that argument. But scientists think that, usually think, that their method provides us with objective knowledge about facts. If that would be true, we would be justified in using that method, and we should use that method to acquire an objective knowledge about the objective facts. But we don't have access to the objective facts, we don't have such a method, so it's uh, therefore um, you should be allowed to use other methods as well to acquire subjective facts, to construct your subjective facts and acquire your subjective knowledge about those subjective facts. So what he is against is against the monopoly that nowadays science has um, in the acquisition of knowledge. That, that would only be justified, this monopoly, if the method would provide us with objective knowledge, and it doesn't. You can look at other methods like religion, so take voodoo. Voodoo uh, is a different method from science, uh, and it also should not have uh, the monopoly on knowledge acquisition. But you should be allowed to use science or voodoo, or any other tradition according to Feyerabend. And that takes us to the second slogan. So he's against method, that is, he's against the monopoly of any method on the acquisition of knowledge. And therefore, he says, anything goes. He means you can use any method to acquire knowledge. So that means that he has anarchy in epistemology. So he calls himself a methodological anarchist. Because if any method can be a source of knowledge, <clears throat> well, yeah, then you need anything goes. <laughs> For example, voodoo and magic. So you should be able to study voodoo for psychologists or magic for psychologists and not magic uh, like doing tricks like Darren Brown or something like that, someone like that, but uh, really magic putting spells. So Harry Potter, like, like that, you should be able to do Harry Potter for psychologists, for real. So clearly, what he is talking about is an epistemological anarchism, right? So not a political anarchism. If, if, if anything at all, he's a uh, defending democracy uh, in politics. So he's defending an epistemological anarchism. And here you see that he's no longer interested um, in uh, science as the only um, method to acquire knowledge, and therefore he will not be interested anymore in a demarcation criterion. So we are back at the question about knowledge. What 
is the source of knowledge. And we saw that with the rise of logical positivism, the answer was science is the source of knowledge. And there was consensus about that. Even though Popper disagreed with the logical positivist, he agreed that science is our source of knowledge. And then this question of what science is, the question of what the demarcation criterion is, becomes relevant because you want to distinguish the real source of knowledge from the fake sources, the fake methods of knowledge. So you want science to be different from voodoo or religion or metaphysics. But Feyerabend says that's only a good answer to the question where knowledge comes from, the answer, it comes from science, if science indeed provides us with a method, if science indeed is a method to acquire objective knowledge, and it isn't. All thoughts are fruitful. And that means that the difference between science and pseudoscience is a kind of artificial difference because you make the difference based on the assumption, the wrong assumption, according to, to Feyerabend, that science provides us with knowledge and voodoo doesn't. Science provides you with knowledge and religion doesn't. And he says, well, voodoo can tell you something about the psyche too. Astrology can, some t can tell you something about personalities of, of people as well. So that becomes relevant for psychology, right? Not only science is a source of knowledge, but also, say, astrology. So you can still classify astrology as a pseudoscience or a non-science, but that's not interesting for Fire Island. And, it, and, and even uh, rejecting astrology would be counter to this idea of um, um, acquiring knowledge. So if, if scientists want to have knowledge, they also should look at astrology. Uh, they also should look at voodoo. They should also look at other religions. So if a scientist really want to understand the world, at Tilburg University you want to understand society, then it is strange to impose restrictions in advance, to, to, to a priori impose restrictions. Because if you say we want to understand society, but we're not going to use astrology, or we're not going to use voodoo as a method to acquire knowledge, then you run the risk of missing things. Because astrology will tell you different facts, subjective facts, creates different facts about the world and therefore you gain different knowledge about those facts than science does. And Feyerabend says, well, I plan to ensure the reader that all methodologies, even the most obvious, have their limitations. So he says, science has a limitation. Voodoo has as well, a religion too, other religions as well. But they all have their limitations. But he also says they all have their positive side. Basically what they do is they all generate knowledge. They all construct facts and generate knowledge about those constructed facts. So you have to become an anarchist if your goal indeed is to acquire all the possible knowledge about the world if you want to understand the world, if you want to understand society, if you want to understand human behavior. Uh, if you want to understand the human psyche, the human mind, then you will be dogmatic if you only accept the scientific method. You should be able to be free to think whatever you want and to be able to be free to choose the method you want to use to acquire knowledge. Because you cannot acquire knowledge about the objective facts. It's always a construction about the world. So therefore, you are allowed to use a scientific method, but you should also be allowed to use uh, a religious method like voodoo. Let's briefly look at the consequences of Fire Arwen's uh, epistemological anarchism. So first of all, knowledge is a sea of alternatives. And second, there should be freedom of methodology in education. So let's look at the first. So what does he mean by his claim that knowledge is a sea of alternatives? It's easy to see. So take, for example, the scientific theory of evolution by natural selection. 
that theory tells us that species have evolved and it takes a long time and if you do the uh, geological research you'll find out that earth is 4.7 billion years old so that's knowledge but according to a constructivist a radical constructivist and a radical relativist as fire island this is just a construction it's not an objective fact it's a constructive fact so it's a subjective fact it's created by the method the theory you use but if you have a different theory about the world, if you're a young earth creationist, then you use different methods. And in this case, the method would be looking at the Bible and then counting and calculating when earth uh, had to be created based on, uh, on those facts. Um, then you'll find out, then you know that the earth is 6,000 years old those two claims are incompatible but it's all knowledge because we can't say that the scientific method scientific tradition is a better tradition than uh, the young earth creationism uh, christian tradition so you, you should be allowed to use both methods but then you'll end up of course with things you know that are not compatible with each other. So that's why he means that knowledge is a sea of uh, incompatible alternatives. That has consequences for people that want to know about the human mind. So if we agree with Fire Island, then there are alternatives to the scientific explanation that an autism spectrum disorder uh, is caused by genetic deficiency. And you might say, well, there are alternatives in science as well. We maybe don't know, or there are people that say, well, uh, uh, it might not be uh, caused by genetic deficiency, but by something else. But Firearm is claiming that, well, it's if someone believes that it's caused by 5G networks, uh, then that is also knowledge uh, and that it's caused by vaccines then that's also knowledge or that it's caused by gnomes that's also knowledge so if if those are knowledge of the facts and you uh, you want to become a clinical psychologist and you want to help people for instance with autism spectrum disorder then uh, you say well you can make sure that people don't develop that because you you just do away with science you do away with uh, genetics because you can choose any method you want and then you'll say well let's keep people away from vaccines well how uh, how can you do that? Uh, well, you need to have this knowledge, of course, to incorporate that in your uh, psychological practice later on. But then you should be able to learn that in your lectures at the university. But at the university, you only get the scientific method and the results of the scientific method. So what Feyerabend is saying that there is a scientific method and that's the one you get taught in your uh, your uh, psychology classes but there are also other methods such as voodoo that we can also use to acquire knowledge and that's why it's not just for science or voodoo to have the monopoly on knowledge acquisition So that means that you should be able to do voodoo for psychologists, as least, at least as an, uh, it, it should be offered as an option uh, by the university. So that's the second consequence. There should be freedom of methodology in education. And he argues against oppression. So, um, you can, you can see where he is coming from. So, um, 
well, he fought in, in World War II uh, on the losing side. And then uh, he became a radical Democrat. And then when he worked in the US, he worked in California. And that was at a time that the Native uh, Americans finally uh, were allowed to go to university. And what happened then? Then they go to university and then their tradition is being rejected. That is, everything they claim to know that stems from their tradition is regarded as false. So you can you, you think you can make rain by dancing. That's that's not true. So and then Firearm basically says this, this was the oppression of the, 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 the tradition of uh, the Native Americans. And he says, we didn't, we didn't choose for science in our educational system. So he is clearly a, a, a Democrat. He is for liberty. And he says, well, we have separated religion from state. We should also separate state from education. We should choose our own method. So, of course, you should be allowed to use to choose science, right? He's not opposed to science. He actually is very interested in science. Um, but you should also be able to study magic or Navajo uh, rain dances. And for a psychologist, that would mean that you should be able to choose, say, astrology for psychologists or voodoo for psychologists. Whatever. Why isn't everyone a relativist and a constructivist? Let's evaluate relativism and constructivism. The first problem is mainly a problem with uh, Kuhnian's theory of paradigms is that Kuhn says that paradigms are incommensurable. You cannot rationally compare them. But how can you claim that if you're not able to rationally compare them? Because he says in one paradigm, uh, someone says the, he's talking about the center of the universe and in the other paradigm, people are talking about the center of the universe and they're talking about two different things. Yeah, but if you, and, and, and therefore they are incommensurable. You, can, you cannot compare them and you cannot compare them to reality who um, makes, makes the best claim. Well, the latter might be, be, be true, but uh, you can rationally compare them and see which predictions are better. Uh, you can do that. And uh, that means that you only can make the claim about the incommensurability of paradigms by making them your own. And that's basically what Kuhn did, of course, when he described <laughs> the history and the development of science. So that, that's basically a strange thing in a theory. How can you say that they are incommensurable if you compare them to each other? The second problem is more general problem that if you say that everything is relative, um, when you say true depends on a paradigm, true depends on the tradition or the facts that are created by the tradition or the facts that are created by the paradigm, that contains a contradiction because this claim is, sub is supposed to be true <laughs> for every paradigm. If, if you're in paradigm A or in paradigm B or in tradition one or in tradition two, then this claim that everything is relative should be accepted by everyone but then it's a, a, a general claim um, and a general claim just cannot be uh, true so so th that is uh, you claim objective um, uh, truth for this um, then you are making also uh, th then you're saying something that's contradictory to what um, you believe. The last one I think is a very serious problem. So the first one 
uh, is a problem with Kuhn's theory. The second one is just about one general claim. But the third problem is, okay, if you are a consequence, I think I think Feynman is really consequent in in what he in, in his thinking, and then he indeed uh, is a proponent of saying that um, that the theory that explains how he can make rain by dancing, or um, how uh, voodoo um, uh, can uh, explain. Uh, what we call uh, mental disorder, should we be able to choose courses that uh, explain that to us? Is that really something we want? So should we <laughs> vote on that? Because firearms, we never voted on science as the method we should use in uh, acquiring knowledge. Should, should, should we indeed be able to choose medicine or magic? That if you feel really ill, that you can also go to a magician, to someone like Harry Potter. Well, hmm, if you want to understand society, if you want to understand humans, if you want to understand uh, mental disorders, for instance, should we really, really believe that because there is this duck rabbit example where that that deliberately was made to have two interpretations that our observation is theory laden and that it's so radically theory laden that this is eventually the conclusion if you feel ill this might be due to a spell that has that someone has put on you Science, obviously, is not a democratic method. Who cares? Does the majority determine what the facts are? Well, yeah, if, uh, uh, if there are alternative facts, if facts indeed are not objective and there is no way of getting them, then sure, then we, but, but then, then, then everything, indeed anything goes, then you, you, you can never say to someone, you're wrong, because the person will always say, well, I just have a different method. Two and two equals four? Yeah, I think so, but you might think it's, it's five, you just have a different method. Okay, you think uh, Trump won um, um, uh, the election? Well, yeah. Uh, you have a different method. You don't even have to count. You just say it. Um, so is that is that a fact? Hmm. Uh, so the, the question becomes, in the end, how strong is this argument of the theory ladenness of observation? Is it as strongly theory laden as the relativist and constructivist claim? Or are we able to find out what the objective facts are? And then if you look at the arguments, The arguments are basically all based on pictures that were made deliberately to have two interpretations, like my very bad copy of the duck rabbit. You can see this as a duck, you can see it as a rabbit. Sure. And if you have the theory that it's a duck, you will see a duck. And if I have the theory that it's a rabbit, I see a rabbit. Sure. But there is more to a duck and there's more to a rabbit than just an ambiguous drawing. So if you look at the original, so the original image was used by uh, Jastrow in uh, 1900, and he wanted to show that perception indeed is dependent on mental activity. So he made it deliberately ambiguous. He, he wrote that down. And then he said, well, if you're walking, so he, he gives this example, if you walk through a forest and you believe in ghosts, then the, uh, a, 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 a white piece of bark on a tree, you might interpret that as a ghost. And if you walk through the forest and you don't believe in ghosts, 
you might interpret the white piece of bark on a tree as a white piece of bark. And he says the first person is wrong. And then others use this to show that basically both are right, because if you have a different theory and the objective facts cannot be known, then it's, an, it's a subjective fact that it's a ghost and it's a subjective fact that it's a, that it's a piece of bark and you're both right, uh, you both have knowledge. No, it's not a ghost. What if, if you look at a picture like this uh, and you say, well, that's clearly an ambiguous picture, but okay, now let's look at animals in nature and, and, and explain that ducks can fly and rabbits cannot. And I use a picture, a real picture like this one. And tell me now that if you have one theory that this is a duck and then if you have another theory, then you'll see a rabbit or yet another theory, of course, then you'll see a giraffe. It could be anything depending on your theory. But if ducks have beaks and wings and you explain what beaks and wings are and that ducks can fly what will happen if you take this animal and throw it out of a tall building well nothing much it will fly away what if you do this with a rabbit don't do it with a rabbit so is the theory relatedness of observation as radical as these people claim, as Kuhn and Weyermann claim, based on, well, two things, those uh, ambiguous pictures and the obvious claim that indeed what you think you see depends on your theory. If you believe in ghosts and you're scared in a dark forest, yeah, I also think that you might mistakenly believe that you see a ghost. But that is a mistake because there are no ghosts. We have very good reasons to believe that there are no ghosts. We have used the scientific method and time and time again, when we do some research, when people say there are ghosts there, there aren't. So this theory relatedness of observation is not as radical as the constructivist and relativists claim. And that means that we can return to philosophy of science again. Because what we saw in Feyerabend basically is a return to epistemology. If you say science is not the only method to acquire knowledge, it's not the source of knowledge, or not the only source of knowledge, then you're back at epistemology. You say, well, what then is the source of knowledge? Well, any method. Okay, we're doing we're doing epistemology again. But if this whole business of relativism and constructivism is based on a really flawed argument, this argument of the theory relatedness of observation resulting in the claim that the objective facts are not accessible to us, that you, that you can never know whether objectively it's a duck or a rabbit. Well, yeah, we can. <laughs> Ducks can fly, rabbits don't. Throw both animals off of, of a building, hmm, you know which one is the duck and which one is the rabbit. That doesn't depend on your observation. You use your observation to find out if, well, if you need that experiment. So that means that maybe it's still a good idea to find a way to separate science from pseudoscience, science from non-science, and get rid of the non-scientific methods at university, and then only teach the scientific method, because that's the only method that enables us to find out what the objective facts are. And then, then the question of what the demarcation criteria, which what the demarcation criterion is to separate science from pseudoscience, that is a relevant question. And that's the question that Imre Lakatos again picked up on. Imre Lakatos was a very good friend of Paul Feyerabend, but he was not agreeing with him. 
He didn't think that anything else important, only science provided us with real knowledge. So let's look at his philosophy of science. Kuhn was only descriptive, he tried to only describe how science changed. Lakatos again is going to be normative, so he tries to find a norm to which science needs to adhere. That means that he's trying to find the demarcation criterion again. So he's trying to separate science from non-science, especially from pseudoscience. Um, Lakatos says, okay, we need to develop some kind of falsificationism. And previous to uh, Lakatos, there was dogmatic falsificationism, and then later there was Popper's falsification, which Lakatos dubbed uh, methodological falsificationism, and he himself defends a sophisticated, a more nuanced way of falsificationism. So it's clear that Lakatos, who calls himself a falsificationist, stands in a tradition of Popper. But he also stands in a tradition of Kuhn. So he says they're both right in some sense, but also wrong in some sense. Popper is um, making the mistake of making his falsificationism clearly not strong enough because using only falsifiability as a demarcation criterion, you uh, and apply this to sentences, then some uh, sentences of um, astrology become scientific, and you don't want that. So it's not a falsification, a popular falsificationism doesn't contain a strong enough demarcation criterion. And Kuhn's description of science denied progress when science uh, radically changes. And I think that we all have at least the intuition that when we change from a geocentric perspective to a helio perspective on uh, planet Earth and the Sun, that, well, you can call it a paradigm change, but like I would say, that's progress. We got closer to the truth. And where Kuhn says that paradigm shift is just a paradigm shift. We started all over again and it was not an improvement. And Lakato says, well, there is something going on like a paradigm shift. He doesn't call it the paradigm shift, of course, um, but uh, we don't start all over again. So progress still is possible. So, okay. What does um, Lakato's claim with respect to the three types of falsificationism? He himself only defends, of course, sophisticated falsificationism. Popper also did not come up with this idea of uh, falsificationism uh, because before Popper there was already a theory of falsificationism by Braithwaite. We're not going to uh, into detail here, uh, but it's just that you know that this uh, uh, was going on back then. What were the assumptions of dogmatic falsificationism, as Lakatos later called this? early falsificationism of Braithwaite. Well, first of all, of course, that every scientific theory is fallible. Okay, that's an assumption that Popper also uh, agreed with and Lakatos also agreed with. But the difference between dogmatic falsificationism on one hand and methodological and sophisticated falsification on the other hand is that Braithwaite argued that the empirical basis was infallible, and he basically defended this around the time of the logical positivist, who also accepted that claim, as we saw. The idea is that you observe the facts the way the, the facts uh, are. So you observe a black swan, then you know this is a black swan, and therefore you can base on that empirical uh, piece of evidence, you can judge that the theory of swans are white is wrong. And then you know that it is false, right? It's actually false, that theory. And then what you do is you have scientific ground for the rejection of the theory based on observed and objective facts. Okay, Popper is slightly different because he 
did not believe in the infallible empirical basis. But that is problematic, right? This infallible empirical basis. We saw that in logical positivism. Um, we have seen that observation is theory laden, and that makes it at least problematic, even if you do not go as far as uh, the constructivist and the relativist, the relativist go. So you can make mistakes. There is no infallible empirical basis. That was a big problem for the logical positivist and also for brainwave. So even if you if you only look at uh, uh, just Ross Duck Rabbit and his example of walking in the forest where you see in the dark and if you believe in ghosts then you might take the white piece of bark uh, of a tree for a ghost then you have an observation that is theory related and then you can make a mistake right um, and that makes falsification problematic because you can also make a mistake that this here is a black swan is it correct that this here is a black swan because if you say all swans are white this is a black swan then uh, clearly all swans are white uh, is false but you could also be mistaken how do you know that the theory you use to say to be able to claim that this is a black swan is correct so that's problematic popper saw that so popper defends what Lacan was later called methodological falsificationism and he accepts the theory relatedness of observation but he also claims that uh, scientists can just accept the background theory the theory you use to say this is a black swan but of course he's, he makes clear that you can be mistaken about that uh, and what you then do is you gather empirical data that can conflict with your theory that's what he says you, have, you run the risk of uh, observing something that conflicts with your theory and because you don't always question your observations he basically says okay we agree as scientists that this here is a black swan and that therefore all swans are not uh, uh, white that all swans are right uh, are white has to be rejected um, because that the conventional empirical basis it's kind of a convention that we don't uh, immediately debate whether our background theory is uh, uh, correct or not and therefore it, he puts the empirical basis between uh, quotation marks because it is an empirical basis but you know it might be wrong so it's not an, uh, a flawless observation of the objective facts and the rejection of a theory according to Lakatos should then not be classified as claiming that the theory is false you don't say all swans are white is a false claim but as a claim that you reject because it conflicts with the observations by using an accepted background theory you still reject it but is it falsifiable is it, is it falsification well in, in some sense it is but it's a rejection based on the assumption that the background theory is correct and you know that it's, it might be false. The big change that Lakatos now um, introduces by using the work of Kuhn is that he says this is not how it works. You don't have a claim, all swans are white, and an observation, this is a black swan, and then you say, okay, this observation, which is theory laden, I know. Um, conflicts with the theory and therefore I reject the theory because I am uh, for the time being um, uh, I can accept this background theory and what he says is yes you have observed a black swan and then you take a look at two different theories two different scientific theories so it is and, and, and you accept the one that fits best with your empirical data 
your empirical data, it's an empirical basis. So it is, you're trying to d d distinguish, you're to, trying to uh, decide which, which of your two scientific theories is better, that is, which fits better, with best with your empirical basis. So this looks like Kuhn's claim that you only reject a paradigm if there is an alternative paradigm. So what Lockhart says is, this is in accordance with Kuhn's analysis of the history of science. So he accepts that and he says that there, so there, there are these big changes. And it's a normative alternative to Kuhn, so it's in line with Popper's falsificationism. It's in line with trying to find a demarcation criterion that separates science from pseudoscience. And then, of course, we have to take a look more at how Lakatos sees scientific change, because apparently he doesn't see this in the way Kuhn did, even though it looks like it, but he rejects Kuhn's descriptive theory of science. He wants a normative theory of science. So how does scientific change work according to Lakatos? Lakatos says that there are research programs, that, that scientists work in theoretical holes um, that contain their theories, their assumptions, uh, their methodologies, and that looks much like the paradigms in Kuhn. Um, and one wants to stick to a research program or at least to the hard core of it. So he has this idea not of a building like we saw in Descartes and, and the uh, and British empiricist. He said we have science or your, your, uh, your theories are like buildings that have a foundation. I think therefore I am. And then you build the rest of your knowledge building on top of that. He is more of a network kind of metaphor where you have your most important theories in the core, the hard core of your research program and on the edges of your research program are the sentences, uh, well, you do not care that much about. So take a look, for instance, at um, biology, then in the hard core of the uh, research program is the theory of evolution by natural selection. If you have to give that up, then you have to give up your entire research program. If biologists find out a oh, theory of evolution via natural selection is wrong, then it's exit of contemporary biology. All the research programs in biology will be gone. Um, but there are clear differences between Lakatos, his research program, and Kuhn's uh, paradigm. For instance, in a paradigm, you have the paradigms only in succession. So you have a paradigm, uh, all scientists accept that, they work in the paradigm, then it gets into a crisis, and it's only then that for a brief moment there is a second paradigm, when someone thinks of it, and then everybody gets uh, to that new paradigm, and then the old one is rejected. So paradigms exist in succession. Research programs can, can coexist at your psychology department. Different psychologists could be in different research programs. At least that is in principle possible, according to Lagatosh. And this is important um, that they can coexist because it makes clear that, that a research program really is something different from a paradigm. So paradigms only exist in succession, and for this brief moment that there are two, if people then try to talk with each other, that is impossible because they are incommensurable. And Lakatos would say, no, 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 you can talk with people from other research programs, and what you actually are trying to do is to try and try and figure out who's right. And then, yeah, well, you need to talk. To each other and that is possible you can say that 
uh, this is true, and the other, and another one, another scientist said that something else is true. Well, try to find out uh, who's right, and that means that you have to be able to rationally compare the theories. And Lakatos says, well, you, you can't do that. Um, so Kuhn's uh, incommensurability uh, thesis is incorrect, and we also saw in one of the, the problems with this idea is that Kuhn says, well, someone in one theory is talking about the, uh, the center of the universe and he's referring to the sun and someone else is talking about the center of the universe and she's talking about uh, uh, Earth and they can't talk to each other. They have all kinds of miscommunications. Why would you think that? We would pretty soon find out that when someone's talking about uh, the center of the universe and is talking about something that's a star and that's really hot and uh, not someone else is talking about the place where she lives in the center of the universe, hmm, you pretty soon find out that one is talking about the sun and the other is talking about the earth. So why would you think that this would lead to confusion and that you can't talk to each other? And the problem, of course, was Kuhn knew this, so Kuhn was able to have a kind of overview of both paradigms, even though the scientist couldn't. Well, that's quite arrogant. Um, so, Lakatos says, let's not talk about paradigms, but research programs. And those research programs uh, contain also the theories, the assumptions, uh, the methodologies of the scientists. And now you're trying to figure out who has the best research program. So, and you can do that. And he says that gives us the possibility to make a distinction between what he calls degenerative research programs, so those are the bad research programs, and the progressive research programs, That's so those are the good research programs. Well, it's the bad, the degenerative research programs that are pseudoscience, that are pseudoscientific. And you can do that by using heuristics. So what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. So a heuristic is a methodological way to find an answer to a problem. And then there are things you should do or you shouldn't do. So these are part of the methodology of your uh, research program. And uh, there, is, there are things you should avoid, that's the negative heuristic, and there are things you should try to do, and that's the positive heuristic. And if you look at this idea of a research program that has a core with theories in them, that uh, if you reject those, you reject the entire research program, and on the sides you have all kinds of hypotheses that, well, could be true, could be false, you don't know, you really don't care that much about it as, as you do about uh, the theories in the core, then it's very clear what you should and shouldn't do. So the negative heuristic tells you what you're not allowed to do. And basically what you are not allowed to do is to reject the core of the research program. So what happens if a biologist sees so so let's take let's take the classical example that popper constantly uses all sons are white so say a biologist but let's say that this belongs to biology um, and then you say okay let's do some research and then you find a black swan what do you do then do you say oh this must mean that the theory of evolution by natural selection is false that is wrong, we should reject it, we should start all over again, biology out of the window, every textbook in biology, let's burn it because it's, or let's put it in the history of, uh, of uh, science um, uh, part of the libraries. No, of course not. You were just wrong about some minor hypothesis that really has no importance with respect to the theory of evolution. So, you're not allowed to reject the core of the research program. If you need to do that, of course, you're allowed to do it, but that's usually what you not do in science. And that also implies a positive heuristic, what to do when you have an observation that conflicts with your research program. Um, 
it tells you what you are allowed to do. And he says, what I have is this core, and that is, for instance, the theory of evolution by natural selection for a biologist. And at the sides are claims I really don't care about, that is, not as much as um, uh, about the core. And he calls this the protective belt, and it protects the core from actual falsification. So it protects from giving up on your research program. And he compares it to a farm with trees around it. So the, there's a farm, it's all out in the open. So if there's a storm, then uh, this storm might uh, damage the farm. But what do you do? You put some trees around the farm and then the trees take the hit of the storm. And if there's some damage to the trees, who cares as long as you don't damage the farm. Here too, a biologist doesn't really care about whether all swans are white or not. A biologist cares about the theory of evolution by natural selection, for instance. So if you have a, uh, an observation that conflicts with one of your hypotheses, well then change your protective belt. And what you do then is say, okay, where did I find this black swan? Oh, in Australia. That's really different from Europe where um, I found the first white swans. So um, now I can think about that. There was a common ancestor of the white and the black swan and that they got separated, which is uh, uh, a reasonable assumption given that there's an ocean between them. Um, and then the evolutionary history, the evolutionary path of the white swans was different from those of the black. And well, uh, hence we have now white and black swans. So it is totally in line with what is in um, the hardcore of the biology, uh, uh, the research pro program of the biologist. So, a progressive research program does this. It says, okay, if I make a prediction and the prediction is false, then I change my protective belt. And that means that the theory becomes more complex and will have more empirical content. That is, it predicts new facts that were previously not predicted and that the prediction come true that they that you find confirming evidence for that. Um, and a degenerate, so medicine, for instance, is, is a, uh, a progressive research program. And then you have a degenerative research program. And what you do is you have a falsification of some hypothesis, and then you try to save uh, the theory, uh, your, your research program. Um, and then the prediction still uh, is uh, that the new, the new theory, the changed research program, uh, makes a prediction. And it's also false, and then you change it again, and again, and again, and again. And constantly, your research program uh, generates hypotheses that come into conflict with what you observe. And if you then have two research programs, and one makes predictions about the same topic, um, and one makes predictions that come true, that are falsifiable but successful, and others are falsifiable but unsuccessful, were are falsified time and time again, then you have clearly a progressive research program and a degenerative research program. And you should abandon that for the alternative research program that has more empirical content. Sorcery, magic, if you try to heal someone, that's nice if you play uh, some uh, fantasy game with a potion, um, with a spell, with sorcery, but that's not real life. It doesn't work in real life. Medicine works. So what should you do? Well, give up on sorcery and accept medicine. That's the progressive research program. And here you see what, what he means by 
uh, okay, it's not theory versus uh, empirical uh, uh, content, empirical data, but it's theory versus theory versus the empirical data. And here you can also see that even though you might be mistaken and that, that there might be a flaw in your uh, theory that you, uh, that you need to observe to get knowledge about the data, um, you usually accept that because you have someone who is ill and then you say, okay, here we have uh, a physician and the physician uh, gives this and this uh, a medicine and this person gets better and we have a person that seems to have the same illness and we have a, a sorcerer and he puts a spell on this person and nothing happened. This person is still ill. Well, <laughs> what's the progressive research program here? So this means that Lakatosh is back at this really important question, how to make a difference between a progressive research program, which is scientific, because that's basically what he now says is a progress research program, that is what science is, and a degenerative of degenerating program, and that's pseudoscience. How do you make the distinction? Well, he's back at the demarcation criteria. He says, okay, you need a progressive program. So what does it do compared to a degenerative research program? It predicts more, as some of these predictions are indeed successful. And then he goes back to Marxism. We saw that Popper had some beef with that as well. And he says, has, for instance, Marxism ever predicted a stunning novel fact successfully? Never. All its predictions were falsified. So he says, yes, that, 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 that was what Popper said. If you take the original uh, theory of Marx, the predictions are all falsified. Why stick to that theory? Because it's refuted. You need a theory that is falsifiable. So that's good. That's, that was good about the original theory, not of the, the new Marxists or the later Marxists that, that made the theory immune for falsification because then it was uh, pseudoscience anyway. But if you uh, take, take the original falsifiable Marxist theory, it has been falsified all, uh, time and again. So you need to have something else. It needs to be not only a research program that is falsifiable, but it needs to have, you need to have a progressive program. And that means that you have, need to have positive evidence and no refutation. And of course, it has to be a real program. It has to generate new hypotheses about things you do not know. So if you take a look at medicine, then uh, back in the days, we were trying to figure out what HIV was. And then you said, well, it's, it's uh, we, or we can talk about Corona. If you take a look at Corona, then you say, well, it's it's a virus, and if it's a virus, then we could try to make uh, a vaccine. And making a vaccine, can you do in this way, in this way, and in this way? And we've tried that, that is, our top scientists have tried that, and they came up with a vaccine. So they, they come up with a real research program, and it took some time. We were all in the lockdown, waiting for the vaccine, and now we have it. That's a progressive research program. You have a core in which, and in this case, in the core is also, of course, uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection and DNA, all the theories of DNA and what viruses are. And then we know how to make a vaccine because we have done it in the past and we have the hypothesis. It will work here as well. And then you say, okay, maybe we haven't seen the things that didn't work, but obviously some of them did work. So now you had a prediction and the prediction was successful. And the same back in the days with H, uh, HIV. We also had hypotheses about that. And uh, these days uh, we have all kinds of medication that makes uh, the, this uh, disease at least much less lethal than it uh, used to be. So we have a series of theories that is scientific. We change the theory and uh, therefore 
uh, and, and we change it in such a way that it, uh, it makes new predictions. And when the predictions become uh, are, are successful, we have some empirical support for that, then they become part of the new theory. Larbush takes the idea of Kuhn's paradigms and turns them into research programs. So what did Kuhn think about that? Right, so Kuhn clearly is one of the philosophers of science that Lakatos um, responds to, and he responds to uh, him in a certain way because he takes his ideas of paradigms and changes that to research programs. And then he says, we can see that there are progressive research programs and degenerative ones, and we can make a distinction between that, and that uh, provides us with a way of making a distinction between science and pseudoscience. So uh, Lakatos cle is clear, that was his goal, and to find an, a, uh, a norm to distinguish science from pseudoscience, and he says, I've succeeded in that. So I have a normative alternative to your descriptive history of uh, science, basically. And Kuhn says, no, 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 you just changed um, the, uh, the jargon, the vocabulary, you changed the words. So he says, though his terminology is different, his analytic apparatus is as close to mine as need be. So we have basically a paradigm, and you can change it to the word research program, but you're still talking about paradigms. Well, is that true? Um, Kuhn basically says Lakatos' view is not different, but well, first of all, does that really matter? Because we had an interpretation, uh, and we that was not something I came up with. Others came up with that. That Kuhn's view, um, Kuhn's view is that you can distinguish science from pseudoscience or from non-science because, well, if you look at the description Kuhn gave of science, then we see that science has a paradigm and non-science doesn't. So having a paradigm is the demarcation criterion of, um, of Kuhn. So <laughs> Kuhn is basically wrong in claiming that he doesn't have a normative theory. And if you then say, well, your terminology is as close uh, to mine as can be, well, then Lakatos can say, yeah, and it's also normative, just as yours is. But we also have seen that there are some really big differences between paradigms and research programs that you can really say, okay, Lakatos is not just uh, 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 changing the terminology and sticking to Kuhn's theory. It's clearly something that's different. Uh, and uh, uh, for instance, uh, he rejects the incommensurability thesis of Kuhn. That is really something that's important. So let's take a closer look uh, if we want to make a list of Lakatos' set of demarcation criteria, because I think now we can actually make a distinction between science and pseudoscience. What we can now do is look at Lakatos' theory and make a brief list of a set of demarcation criteria, because that's that's what he did, right? So. The logical positivists were looking for one demarcation criterion. Popper was looking, looking for one demarcation criterion. Lakatos says Popper had found a very good demarcation criterion, but it wasn't strong enough. And instead of looking for something else, he tries to adjust that theory. He says it is falsificationism, which is imp the, the important way to go if you think about science versus pseudoscience. And falsifiability, thus, is the main demarcation criterion. And every claim that is not scientific, sorry, that is not falsifiable, is not scientific. And then he says, but you also have to look at an entire research program. You don't look at a sentence in isolation. You judge whether a research program is scientific or not. So if you have just one claim, you don't judge that particular claim to be scientific or not. You, you judge the research program of which the claim is part as 
whether it's scientific or not. And then he says, well, you need a research program. And that he got from Kuhn, where Kuhn used paradigm, he says, and, and a paradigm is a, is a scientific whole, you could say. A research program is also a scientific whole containing theories, assumptions, and methodologies. And his research program has to be progressive, and that is something that is in line with uh, logical positivism. Logical positivists were looking for evidence. They want either to verify or to confirm a theory or a claim. Uh, and Lagatos also says, well, yeah, you need that as well. You need confirmation. You need corroborating evidence, uh, Popper would say. You need to have a research program that makes predictions that are successful because that is what a progressive research program is. If you have a research program that makes falsifiable claims, falsifiable predictions that are being falsified time and again, then there's something wrong with your research program and you should go to a research program about the same topic that is progressive. So then three and four are quite similar. The research program uh, are, are very close to each other has to be progressive and if not you are not allowed to claim to a degenerative research program unless you try to make it into a progressive research program so you don't just stick to a degenerative research program so you, you don't say okay i have a degenerative research program i make this prediction it's been falsified what's my next prediction my next prediction is the same prediction you already know that it has been falsified, and that is clinging to a degenerative research program, and that's the hallmark of pseudoscience. Right, so let's apply it to psychology. A psychology a science according to this set of demarcation criteria. Well, that's not totally clear, for similar reasons that it wasn't clear in uh, uh, Kuhn's unintended demarcation criteria, because the question is, what is the research program? You could argue that the different uh, psychological disciplines, let's call it like that, might have different research programs. Uh, you could also argue maybe that evolutionary psychology is part of the hardcore of all uh, of the entire uh, psychological research program. Maybe materialism is. Are there dualists in psychology? Uh, so if our dualist in psychology, then um, materialism is not part of this hardcore. Also, we have a replication crisis in psychology, and not only in psychology, so it, it, it's also a problem in other sciences, um, in other disciplines maybe. Uh, so if you make a prediction and it is successful, but if you then try to replicate the success of that prediction and you fail, then it looks like your research program is degenerative, or at least you need to do something. You just can't stick to your research program. So that is a problem. I think the replication crisis shows that there is a problem in psychology, and, th and that is what you then do. You, you judge the entire research program as whether it's progressive or degenerative. And it could be a problem just of, say, social psychology. He said, well, no, in, in uh, neuropsychology, we don't have that problem. If you make a prediction there that's falsifiable, part of our uh, research program, uh, in which you, for instance, say that mental states are actually um, identical to certain brain states, and you make predictions based on that um, part of uh, the uh, the, 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 the core of the theory, then our predictions are falsifiable, but are uh, successful, will not be falsified. So then you have a progressive research program in um, neuropsychology, but maybe not in social psychology. I leave this to you to judge this, to find this out. Um, so we will discuss this again in the alternative to the tutorials. Uh, and also in the live tutorials uh, we now have on campus. Um, so we'll get back to this uh, at a later date, but it is something I think that you can, you need to think about, because I, I think Lakatos 
gives us the best way to separate science from pseudoscience. And then the question is, what's the consequence for psychology if you look at it this way? We can conclude that we do have a set of demarcation criteria. It works. And what we can now say is that there are so many problems with relativism and constructivism that both Kuhn's and Feyerabend's theories uh, can be rejected. And with the new attempt of uh, Lakatos to try and use falsifiability as the demarcation criterion, adding others to that, we can actually make a distinction between science and pseudoscience. Kuhn argues that it's not a normative alternative, but we have seen that it actually is. So now we have a way to distinguish science from pseudoscience. So now we have a way to distinguish science from pseudoscience. What is left to think about? Well, next time we'll see that we are again thinking about skepticism, empiricism, but in a slightly different, of course, contemporary context. Next time we'll take a look at different views in philosophy of science that are debating with skeptics and relativists. We'll take a look at scientific realism, constructive empiricism, pragmatism and what's really important for uh, the rest of this course at naturalism. So let's briefly take a look at a question about Lakatos, a question that you can expect on an exam. According to the positive heuristic, what should scientists do, according to Lakatos? A. Change the protective belt of a research program as soon as an observation occurs that is incompatible with the theory. Okay, so we have a prediction, falsification of it. What should you do? Should you reject the entire uh, um, hardcore? Obviously not. You should just change the protective belt. So this is the correct answer. Change the hardcore of a research program as soon as an observation occurs that's incoherent with the theory. Now, obviously not, because that would be giving up on your research program. You only do that if you have falsifications of your predictions time and time and time and time again. Uh, C. Leave a research program as soon as it is established that another research program is incompatible with it. Well, that's clearly nonsense. So if you have two incompatible research programs, what you do is you find out which one makes the better predictions. So it's not that because you have an, a, a different research program that's incompatible with uh, an old one um, or another one uh, that you should reject the one you're in. Um, D, leave a research program as soon as it is established that another research program is incommensurable with that. Well, that's just for the same reason, just as a nonsensical. So indeed, A is just the only right answer here. That's it for lecture seven, stay safe.